With cases of gender-based violence on the rise, mental health is becoming an important topic to discuss. Eunice Okoth and Whitney Ndemo are here to help create awareness. Eunice and Whitney, Karibuni, tell us a bit about who you are. Okay, I'm Okoth Eunice. I work with Tinada Youth Organization. Yeah, and Tinada Youth Organization, we were based at Migosi, but Currently now we are based at Tom Boyer Estate near St. Francis Hillside Hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. and Whitney. Yes, uh, my name is Whitney Ndemo. I work at Tinada Youth Organization as a psychosocial officer. Nice. Yes. So you're talking about Tinada, Tinada Youth Organization. Yes. Tell us about it. What is it? What, do, what, what is done there? What are the activities yeah. done there? So just to start us off, mm -hmm. Tinada is not an abbreviation, it's a full name. The founder of the organization started uh, it from, uh, uh, he started the organization using the vision of the grandmother who was passionate about education, who was passionate about women and the vulnerable people, who was also passionate about empowerment. And so out of it, the grandmother was called Christine and since in law, grandmother is called Dana. So, mm -hmm. so short form of Christine, it's Tina, Dana, so Tinada. Wow. So Tinada Youth Organization, it is a youth-led organization, and it is also a youth-focused organization that operates in the western uh, region of Kenya. That is most of, uh, more of the lakeside region. And uh, we operate in Kisumu County, Homa Bay, Kakamega, Vihiga, Bungoma. And right now we are also extending to Kisi and Migori. Yes. <coughs> Uh, as an organization, um, uh, we seek to enhance an holistic uh, well-being of the young people through strategic partnership of uh, integrated mental health services, uh, economic empowerment, uh, decent work and, and uh, economic growth, and also we focus also on disaster risk reduction. And also as an organization, um, we do our programs through advocacy. We do also our programs through, as I've mentioned, strategic partnership. Uh, we do prevention and promotion uh, because uh, our vision is to have an empowered, healthy young person. And we also do treatment care and rehabilitation, which we're going to speak on much later. Yeah. And we also do training, <coughs> education, research, and capacity building mm -hmm. of various groups. And so our work, most of the time, uh, since I've said that it, uh, where the vision of the organization came from, we focus on families, we work with schools, we work with uh, hospitals, we work in the community, and we also work with the national and the county government. Because, as I've said, we also do advocacy, which means that we need policy makers <laughs> and we need true, people true. up front to help push for agendas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tinada is known for mental health, uh, and mental health, as we are going to speak, it focuses, it cuts across on many things. Mm -hmm. So we also look at, uh, uh, it's also, apart from mental health, it's known for as home of brains. So we do brain awareness. So on brain awareness, we also teach on effects of drugs and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. So most of the time we, keep, we equip young people with skills to ensure they, have, they ac can access uh, health services and, we, and increased health services. And we also try to normalize conversations that are usually deemed as taboo in the community. So as a gender officer, yes. in whatever, all that she has said, the interesting work you do at Tinada, mm -hmm. what is the role of a gender officer in here? Okay, you know, mm -hmm. as she has just mentioned, mm -hmm. in Tinada we have different programs that are taking place. And uh, as gender officer, I always work with all the departments that are mm -hmm. within Tinada Youth Organization to ensure that all this issue of gender equity 
is incorporated mm -hmm. to all the programs and all the activities that are taking place in Tenada Youth Organization. Mm -hmm. And also, we, we, I also do the planning with them. Then we, I will do, I will also do, do the implementation. Then I will also be doing follow-ups with them. My main work is to make sure that, to ensure that all the, the issues of gender equity is implemented in all the programs that are in Tenada Youth Organization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. With, uh, Whitney has, had mentioned uh, the different counties yeah, that you mm -hmm. work in. Mm -hmm. So what assessments have you made on the situation around gender-based violence along the Lake Region Basin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, along the Lake Region Basin, the assessment that we have got, find is like you see, like now we have, we have come to find out that there is this issue of lads. We have the issue of informal settlements in Kisumu, mm -hmm. where you find that we have so many slums in Kisumu. And in these slums, we have come to realize that there are so many issues of gender-based violence there. So you find that in these slums, the issue of gender-based violence, it is too high. And it is really affecting everybody that is there. You find in a family, you find that the, these families that are using drugs, Mm -hmm. And you find the parents are also involved in these drugs. So it finds a time the children who are in this family, they this thing that they like from the parent. They like this parental care, parental, parental attention. Mm -hmm. So you find in this situation, the children are also, are also being affected. Physically they are affected, emotionally they are affected, psychologically they are all both affected. Now uh, within the Lake region again, we have the issue of now floods. When we talk of Nyando, mm -hmm. we find that there are so many families that have been displaced from their own original home. They have been taken to churches, they have been taken to schools. And you, when you go th there, you find that most of those people who are being affected are women and children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the issues of these floods and informal settlements, we, need, we still need to work on it. It still needs our attention, the attention of the county government. Let's find out how we can these things can be solved. The good thing in Tenada, we have this program under disaster risk reduction. So far, they are really working on this. We go, we meet those families, we have a talk to them. If there is there are any support they need from us as Tenada Youth Organization, mm -hmm. and we came to realize that as they go through all this, these people are, their mental well-being also need to be taken well care of. Mm -hmm. So that's how we also, after the disaster risk reduction team has gone out there, they have identified these people. Mm -hmm. They have gone to homes, to schools where they are. They will come back. They will also come to our psychosocial officers. They will talk to them. Then from there, they will go and meet these families. Mm -hmm. they, we need, they still need to do this sensitization on mental health. Mm -hmm. They have to talk to them because Indeed, they are mentally affected. What is the relationship between uh, mental health and gender-based violence? Um, whenever disasters happen, or whenever we are having these uh, societal issues that usually go around, you usually find that uh, somehow the most affected people will always be children. Yes, everyone is affected, but those who are highly affected will be children, women, and the elderly people. So when we are looking at the link between gender-based violence and uh, mental health, uh, we'll, we usually say that uh, there is no health without mental yeah. health. And most of the time, when we talk about mental health, we're talking about the well-being mm -hmm. of a person whereby, even in the case of stress, you can still be in a position to cope, to cope up with the normal day-to-day -day stress and still be able to be productive and reach your full potential. If you're not well taken care of, the next person you will express your frustrations to will be the next less threatening person. So if you're a boss at work, it will be employees. If you're a, a man or a woman in the house, it will be your next partner or your children. So most of the time you realize, when you're talking about gender-based violence, it does not just wake up one morning and it mm -hmm. happens. It is a pattern of things that has been happening. And most of the time you realize it is something that happened to you that you did not take care of. And it has gotten to a point whereby it is so classical that now it is the next, you're not the only person affected, but it's the person next to you who is affected. And that is why when something happens, Eunice will come in. And when Eunice comes in, we also come in and, and try to find a way of how to work hand in hand. Like for example, if a child was, I was violated today, Eunice comes in and ensures that this child is getting justice, maybe by this perpetrator going to 
to be to to get a sentence and go to prison. Mm -hmm. As psychologists, we come in and we make sure that this child mental health has been taken care of. The immediate family has been taken care of. The community where this child is living is taken care of, and this perpetrator has also is is also serving his sentence. Speaking of units coming in, yeah. what uh, response measures do you have in place at Tinada to help mitigate such cases or such situations when you get that call? So for us as Tinada, first thing we do, the first response we do, we go to the ground. We want to see. Maybe we have received a case of defilement case of maybe there is a domestic violence somewhere, we will, after we have received the referral, we go to the ground, we sit, and then we sit with the family members. If it's a case of defilement, we'll sit with the family members, we talk, we do the assessment, like we, we want to know what is happening. From there is when we can come back and now we can manage, we, I, we can, I can be able to identify. Now that I've gone through this, and I've mm -hmm. gone to the ground, I've understood what has taken place there. What is the next step for me? Does this case need just normal counseling? Mm -hmm. Does it need any further referrals? Mm -hmm. So from there, I will be able to identify. For this case of, uh, of defilement, they have not gone to the hospital. They have not reported the case. So from there is when I will talk to the family now that this child has been defiled. We need to go to the hospital. We need to go to and report this to the police. Then as we continue with this process, that's when I will also get to our psychosocial officers and talk to them. Then I will refer the, the family of this child and the child himself or herself to our psychosocial officers sorry, mm -hmm. for more counseling. Mm -hmm. Then so as I continue with this legal process, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the counseling, the psychosocial Social officers will continue their counselling. They normally do it, they can do it if the family agrees, they can do it one-on-one. -on -one. They can have that one-on-one -on -one session with the family members, with the child. Mm -hmm. and Or if they find it difficult to access our office, they can do it online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and most of, the, most of those cases we do advise them to do it, to have just one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Because for the child now to open up, you know, maybe you, the, the place where he is, that is at their home, it is not maybe safe for her. You just understand when a child goes through defilement. Maybe the defilement that took place, it is from the, maybe the biological father, brother, mm -hmm. uncle. So you know when he's there and he's seeing those people, he, she can't be able to open up and talk about it. So mm -hmm. you find our psychosocial officers will go there, they will talk to the child, the family, they will talk to the child, then we will give a safe space for this child where she can open up, she can talk, she can identify the perpetrator. So we will refer also to our police and as we continue these legal services, we start with also village elders, we start with the chief. Are you aware of this thing that happens there? Mm -hmm. So we have so many things that we normally do in the community. The, we start with the response, then we come to those measures. So, yeah. Whitney, kindly tell me, uh, how do you get to, how do those calls come in? How do you identify these uh, victims or survivors? Is there a toll number that you have that people call mm -hmm. or it's just referrals only? We usually handle these cases directly and indirectly. Directly, first and foremost, it's whereby we are in our, uh, when we are doing our work, we are in the community and we meet these persons. Mm -hmm. For example, maybe I might be doing a community sensitization or I might be in a support group and I realize in, in, in our sharing there is someone who has broken down. When, I, when we try to dig in, we realize there's an issue of abuse. Then we link this person with Eunice as we are also doing our work. That is first, first uh, response. Second response is where we get them indirectly, whereby as an organization we also have peer educators that we work with and uh, youth champions who are situated in the various sub sub counties that you work in. If it is in Kisumu, we have the seven sub counties. If it is in Oma Bay, we have 35 champions. Mm -hmm. So we have these persons as they are doing their work, they get referrals, the referrals they call us, then we go in and take response. As Eunice has also mentioned, we also work hand in hand with the, with the, el with the village elders. We work with ward admins, we work with the chiefs. We also work with the police and hospitals whereby when they meet these cases, for instance, if it is a hospital, they may call us to help them to, to help this victim get justice where we are working with FIDA. 
if it is in the community they call us to help them link up with the various services that are required so in terms of toll free number we have uh, our psychologist number our resident psychologist we have our office number uh, like uh, Tinada youth organization uh, we have our we have uh, our number 07 70 717 uh, 891 and then uh, we'll also share in the uh, our social media pages mm -hmm. Yes, and then we, we also work with the county government and the various hospitals that have the various toll free numbers. Yeah, maybe stations. to add on, I think we also have, we normally do radio talk shows mm -hmm. on integrated mental health and gender based violence. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so from there, we leave our contacts and you will find that we normally reach many people through those radio talk shows. Yeah, we, we, mm -hmm. because you will find people calling and we, we respond to them. Even some of the survivors, some of these, we normally give them direction where they, and they can access our offices to come and report their issues. Okay, so how do cases of gender-based violence affect one's mental health, both on a primary level and a secondary level for you as officers and also the victims? You know, issues of gender-based violence, these things are not new. They are things that have, they have always been there. And as I talk uh, on my journey as the gender officers mm -hmm. on these issues, you know, there are some situations that when you get a, a referral, yeah, mm -hmm. you go there to ground, you go to ground now, you want to see what is happening. There are some situations that when you reach there, just seeing them before even starting to do anything, you are, you are already traumatized. So sometimes it is a very traumatizing journey. Mm -hmm. But I thank God in Tinada we have the psychosocial office there. Yeah. Sometimes when you have just the burnout, we just go and we have a healthy talk, the briefing. And from there, then I just say, oh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I have to stand up, I have to still move and fight for these people. So you, it is a tough journey, but it needs passion. Okay. If, you are not, if you don't have that passion in you, you can't do it. Because <laughs> you will start and on the way, you just feel like after all, mm -hmm. they're the ones suffering, not me. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Yeah. So, Whitney, what about the victim? Yeah, so um, just before I first talk about the victims, mm -hmm. apart from just uh, unis, we are also working with other case managers mm -hmm. from other departments, from other organizations. We offer them also psychosocial support. And, be, and I think we forgot to mention, mm -hmm. uh, as an organization, uh, through the various funded programs that we are having, we are offering psychosocial support pro bono. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so you come for services, someone is paying for your service. Yes, so when I talk about how victims are usually affected, the, the immediate and also the aftermath in the future, you find that when, um, when, when an abuse has happened or when a violation has happened, it could be sexual, it could be verbal, it could be emotional and financial. Those are the various forms of GBV, that, that of gender-based violence that usually happens. Mm -hmm. And most of the time you'll find that when it happens, there is the, usually the fact that it lowers one's self-esteem. Uh, when you are talking about the immediate, the trauma that it ha that affects you, there is the if there is the physical, uh, there is the physical ha uh, injuries that usually happen, which could be managed, and some are usually permanent. Uh, uh, when you are also talking about sexual violence that happens, it could happen to you when you are a child, when it will happen to you when you are an adult, and sometimes you find that there are those physical injuries that happen. If it was you being beaten, there are those bruises that happen. We've seen kids who have also who have even been burnt by iron box, who have been burnt by firewood, who have been broken arms. This is something that will always stay with you permanent. Mm -hmm. So most of the time you'll find that when, when something tra traumatic has happened to you, it will affect how you sleep. Other people start having insomnia. It will affect your eating patterns. Others even become suicidal. We've known of people who killed themselves, right? It pushes some to even, uh, to, uh, since they want to numb the feelings that they are feeling, these hard feelings, some will even resort to taking drugs and substance abuse. And sometimes you'll even find there is the fact, uh, it, it affects even someone's concentration in terms of work or even in terms of their studies if they are children. 
uh, it lost one's self-esteem if it was emotional abuse or if it was bullying that was taking place. And when you're looking at what happens over time and even later on, you'll find if it was sexual abuse, someone grows up maybe hating men. There's some violence or some hurt that when they happen to you, you will never forget for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But when counseling comes in, it just helps you know how to manage. So in as much as yes, we are also talking about the, phys the physical and sexual abuse, which is the most common, yeah. there are these that usually go unhand uh, unheard of of the emotional abuse that also usually happens in relationships, in families, which usually sometimes affect children if it is happening within the immediate family. Or if you're an adult, it will affect you and your, and your various relationships. Nowadays, we usually ask, why do you have a lot of young people who are not married, not re interested in relationships? If you try to look back, there was a lot of abuse that was unspoken of that happened in their past. Okay. Just to finish, how can the community step in to help eradicate gender-based violence and also create awareness on mental health that it's important to mm -hmm. take note? Yeah, I think what the community has to do uh, mm -hmm. First, as, as as the organization, mm -hmm. we, c we have come to realize that the, most people from the community, they lack this knowledge. They don't have the information on how to go about these issues of gender-based violence. And from mm -hmm. there is when now we have come to, we have our, the peer educators that she was talking about, mm -hmm. that are on ground. Then these peer educators, they are like the ambassadors, like mm -hmm. our, the link to the community. So we normally do this sensitization for these community people to understand. Remember, if we don't, if they like the information, there's nothing they can do about the issue of gender-based violence. Mm. So they we have to do the sensitization. We need to have the community dialogue with them. So well, by we can we just have a, co a normal talk, and mm. then we listen from them. We give them time. We listen to the, from them the perce mm. their perception on gender-based violence. How do they understand this gender-based violence? How, do, how do, do they normally understand the forms of gender-based violence? Because you know, on this issue of gender-based violence, we have come to realize that most people and most partners, they only focus on sexual gender-based violence. While we have physical, we have verbal, we have this uh, emotional, we have psychological, all those are violence. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, we need first to do more sensitization in the community. Okay. When they have this knowledge with them, they will be able to come and speak up. We also need to teach them on the referral pathways. They have the village elders with them. They have the chiefs. They have the police. You know, there's this issue that when gender, gender violence takes place in the community, there's this sugar coating of like, it is a family matter. Let wow. us just handle it within the family. Like women are being threatened. Now the husband has defiled your child. You can't go to court with your husband and stand with your husband in the court and you find these things are filing that being they don't report them so once the community has the information with them then work will be easy because any violation that takes place they will remember they have the information and they, somebody somewhere talked about it so for me as units where i sit and with with our um, with my organization i can see we are doing a lot and we have managed to reach so many young, vulnerable people that have been violated. Another organization is really doing a lot in the community. And we are working with the community. Because remember, as a gender officer, I'm not only supposed to be working with in the office. I have to go to the community, make them aware. So Whitney, in just one statement, what can you say? What can you add on that? Uh, just in addition, there is something that we usually call safety nets, mm. which we are trying to enable them uh, to be there in the communities and uh, in these safety nets what is included with the safety nets number one is to create issues of food security mm -hmm. whereby as an organization we are trying to link them with issues of decent work uh, economic, economic empowerment uh, we are also talking we are also looking at empowering communities and families and also increasing the women's social capitals mm -hmm. through and through ensuring and linking them with various uh, programs and activities and also ensuring that uh, there is health care response screening and psychosocial support and also linking them with the various uh, supports that yeah. they need. Interesting. Thank you so much. You're doing an amazing work at Tinada and also individually. I know it's not an easy task. Yeah. The passion is needed. Yeah. I myself <laughs> cannot do it, mm -hmm. but you can, you mm -hmm. can. 
keep mm -hmm. doing it and mm -hmm. let us help our community rise. Mm -hmm. Be your neighbor's keeper, be your own keeper. Do not yes. ignore your mental health. Do not ignore the, the you know, things that are happening in society that you think are not right. Mm -hmm. Say a word, the toll mm -hmm. numbers are there. Call, text, SMS, anonymously also. You can help someone out there. This yes. has been Youth in Action. I am Nyangweso Grenis. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. This is the way to do it. This is the way to do it. This is the way.